Um, and welcome again, everyone, uh, to the session on the, we call it the Generation Gap, uh, which is going to be an intergenerational dialogue uh, between established institutions uh, like the GCA, also representatives from the COP2016, um, and as well as uh, um, participants who belong to civil society organizations and established institutions who are seeking uh, to work uh, on putting young people uh, at the heart of the work they do. Um, to get us started, we are trying to use this session to answer some very critical questions which we know sit on the, on the minds of many young people uh, and very thoughtful organizations as well. And uh, one central question is how can we ensure adaptation and development that respects the radically different priorities of new generations? Um, and this is a very difficult uh, question to answer. Um, and with your brilliant engagement and participation in this session, we are hoping to develop a pathway or some recommendations on how we can achieve that. So really looking forward to your contribution to the session when you can. Um, part of the reason why did we created this session uh, at CDA uh, 14 was that over the past years, we've seen that young people are seeking to influence decision making through different approaches. Um, and this, I believe, have also been the attraction for participants at CBA 14 to join this session uh, because it was part of the session description that we see that different young people use by various approaches like protest, social media campaigning, petition, flash mobs to express themselves and express the, the changes they wish to see. At the same time, we know that uh, institutions are struggling to take on all these demands that are coming from young people uh, and integrate them into policies and make it actionable. So how do we achieve that? And that is the reason why we've got it here today. To open the session, we will have a short poll um, to get to know who is in the room, what your experiences are, where you're coming from, um, and to get some statistics behind this event. So I will ask um, our Zoom support uh, from CBA 14 to launch the poll. Um, and please take some few minutes to respond to these questions. Um, and then we will get to know how diverse we are at this event and we can get it, get it going. So, um, Alione and Lynn, uh, please uh, launch the poll. Thanks. Great. So I believe you should have the poll now on your screens. Um, feel free to scroll down once you are done answering uh, the questions uh, which are sort of uh, showing up. So question one and two and afterwards you can scroll down. There are five questions in all. Um, and we will wait for majority of you to respond before we close it, so please do so. We're looking at age, gender, regions you are calling in from, your knowledge on climate adaptation, um, and as well as your occupation. Once we are done with this, um, I will invite five representatives of the Youth Adaptation Network um, being established by the Global Center on Adaptation. Um, and they will talk about the outcomes of the consultations that have been held in their region, as well as key questions that they have for the GCA COP2016 um, and the Climate Adaptation Summit coming up next year. Um, and afterwards, we will have um, representatives from these organizations responding to these questions. So the youth reps, uh, please uh, be ready to, to step in once the poll is done. So we have 50 respondents out of 63. Great, I think we can close it when we get to 90% 90, 90 of the poll. Um, so Lynn and, and uh, Aliona uh, kindly help on that once we have 90% um, of the participants uh, voted. Okay, we're on 87. If you haven't voted, please do. So we can hit 90%. <laughs> So 89%. I think the challenge is that people are still joining while we vote. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. 
Great. Okay. So I think we can close it now. Uh, we have 58 people. Okay. Now we hit 90%. Brilliant. Okay. So let's share the results and see how diverse we are uh, at this event. Great. So interesting. Um, we have people within the age of 13 to 20, which I find very impressive. And I'm very happy to see that uh, for a Zoom call. Um, and I, I'm very happy that we could we could manage this. Um, we have sort of majority between the ages of 26 to 30, uh, which is great. I'm very happy that we have 36 plus uh, people also on the call to bring in the perspectives of uh, the older generation uh, and as well as uh, established institutions who are joining us today. So that is really awesome as well. Majority of the people are between 21 and 35, which is great. So it's a very youthful event. Uh, Gender-wise, uh, we have majority being female. I'm very happy to see this as well, uh, given that there's a lot of work going on by different organizations to really mainstream gender, even in the youth conversation as well. We have great representation from Asia, from Europe, and from Africa. Um, that is awesome. And we have representation from Latin America, Australia, Pacific region, and North America as well. Um, and we have sort of uh, people with somewhat knowledge on climate adaptation. And I think this is really the argument for why we, have, we need to have more events like this to really put focus on climate adaptation and also further on talk about the youth adaptation network which we are putting together. Um, and yes, uh, we are very diverse in our sector. We have policymakers here, we have uh, researchers here, we have private sector here, and we have civil society here. So we have everything we need to really get to the objective we set for ourselves, um, which is to be able to uh, develop a pathway on how we can really accommodate for the radical uh, needs uh, and priorities of new generations. To move to the next uh, uh, step of this event, I will be inviting five young leaders uh, uh, from around the world who will be talking about the outcomes of consultations that was uh, held uh, by the Global Center on Adaptation through the Youth Adaptation Network uh, all across the globe. Uh, they'll be talking about what were the outcomes of these youth consultations and present key questions to our panelists today. So first, I will call Russia uh, Hassan from the Middle East. Russia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joshua and Anna, for, uh, uh, for creating this uh, meeting. And uh, welcome everyone uh, to this meeting. I would like to welcome everyone. Uh, I am Russia. I am uh, from Syria uh, and located now in uh, Cadiz, Spain. Uh, I am a PhD candidate in uh, climate, uh, in natural change, and uh, global ch um, natural systems and climate um, change in University of Barcelona. Uh, I provided some insights about my region uh, problems regarding uh, the climate change and climate adaptation issue. I illustrated that uh, the climate um, adaptation is not a priority in my, uh, in my region, unfortunately, uh, due to many problems and issues, including uh, uh, um, uh, political instability, uh, environmental, um, uh, lacking of environmental technical skills, uh, and uh, lack of uh, freedom, uh, and fro um, political uh, freedom, so youth cannot express uh, their uh, opinions uh, uh, in a healthy way, um, if we can say. Uh, moreover, we, uh, I, uh, uh, during the COVID-19 uh, uh, phase, we were hit um, uh, severely uh, by economic crisis. So I would like to ask uh, that how would you link um, climate adaptation to the needs of people, the people who are trying uh, to, uh, to fulfill their day-to-day -day, uh, basis needs, basic needs? This is my first question. Thank you very much. We will take all the questions and later on, um, okay. Karina uh, and Mike will respond to that together with uh, uh, Matt. So please go ahead if you have a second okay. question. 
my no. second question is uh, would you would you provide uh, extra support and extra financial uh, aid uh, to the youth of uh, the middle east to to build their capacity uh, and uh, try to raise awareness about the importance of climate uh, climate adaptation thank you very much Thank you very much. That, that's really uh, key questions uh, coming out there re like regarding political instability and uh, survival, uh, linking that to climate adaptation. Um, I will take next Zai from the Amazon region and an indigenous representative and uh, a bit of a background. So there was a consultation held particularly for um, indigenous people within uh, uh, Latin America with a huge focus on the Amazon area. And together, there was a second consultation with indigenous representatives across uh, Latin America, Canada, and uh, Asia. Uh, and we will have Zai sharing some insights on that and posing key questions uh, that came out of this consultation. Zai, please, uh, over to you. Please unmute. Um, great. Hi. Good morning. Um, <laughs> first, I would, would like to say sorry about my English. Uh, <laughs> I need to improve. <laughs> so, fine. And if you have issues, Anna will be able to translate uh, Portuguese to English for you. So please feel uh, confident to express yourself. Yeah. Okay. Can pode traduzir essas vão traduzir, né? Pode falar que eu traduzo para você. Ai, que bom, Ana, você é tudo. <risos> é, é porque o meu inglês, é, enfim, eu falo, mas ele é meio ruizinho, eu entendo muito melhor. E aqui é cedo, então eu ainda estou meio, meio lesinha, assim. Mas, enfim. Tá, vou falar primeiro que eu, que eu sei inglês, né, tá? First, I, I would like to say I'm very happy to be here today, and I think this is very important. And I would like to talk about my a little about my my place uh, here. We have a big problem uh, in the land, indigenous land. Uh, we have a, a lot of invasions. I was in indigenous lands Uruguay, and there we can see. I have a fine because I don't know if I was there. I was there in the land, I was there in the land of Uruguay, and there, not only in the land of Uruguay, but in all the lands of the indigenous Rondônia, we can find enormous deaths. Enormous é, invasões das terras indígenas, é, em desrespeito mesmo dos direitos indígenas né? e, e dos direitos ambientais e da, da floresta, sabe? E yes. I, I'm, 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 I'
E isso está afetando diretamente a vida das pessoas, porque Porto Velho é, é uma das cidades que o, o Covid está crescendo em vez de diminuir. Entendi. Ok, eu vou traduzir para eles então. Uh, and Chai also said to us uh, that uh, this year has been a critical year because she has never been so much uh, smoke and uh, fog because of uh, the burning of the forests. And she said that last year was an extremely critical year, but she has never seen what happens this year. And this is not only affecting the forest itself, but you can already see this, this smoke going to the city. So when you go from the indigenous communities to the city, so Chai said that now she's located in the capital of uh, uh, Rondonia, which is Porto Velho, you already can see those smokes from there and also in the roads from the, um, the forests to the big cities. And this is a problem that it's affecting even the health, as we can see that in this location where is she, it's uh, that she's um, in this location where she is, uh, the cases of COVID, they are increasing instead of decreasing as in the rest of the country at this moment. So it's a problem of uh, health public problem. You can it, Chai. E aí a minha pergunta é exatamente como essas, essas políticas, né, vou, vou chamar assim, é, vão de, como e se vão mesmo é, chegar de fato é, nas pessoas que estão na base da luta mesmo das mudanças climáticas que somos nós, os povos indígenas, entendeu? Como, de fato, é, nós vamos ser beneficiados ou como, de fato, isso vai nos ajudar na, na nossa luta é, para... Porque hoje em dia é, se diz que já não, não são mais mudanças climáticas, né? se chama de emergências climáticas porque já não se pode mudar o que já foi feito, apenas diminui as consequências. E como ajudar, nos ajudar a poder diminuir essas consequências, entendeu? É, se isso de fato vai chegar na, na base de quem está lá na aldeia, porque a gente sabe que existem é, N dificuldades, né? Perfeito. Eu vou traduzir e aí eu vou uh, fechar para passar para o próximo, então, tá, Chai? Tá bom. Obrigada, viu, Ana? <risos> Imagina, obrigada a você. Uh, so, uh, Chai asks uh, to us if those policies they, that we are proposing, they will really reach the grassroots organizations, especially the indigenous communities, because she says that it's extremely, and she knows that it's extremely hard to reach those communities for any different types of challenges. Uh, and she wants to know how uh, it's uh, taught to be done and if it is going to be really effectively done to those communities. Uh, so this is her question and she also mentions the importance that nowadays we talk about climate emergency and not more about climate uh, change uh, because we need already uh, to act and to do because people are really suffering, especially indigenous communities. So thanks a lot. Muito obrigada, Chai. Uh, and over to you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, Tai and Anna for, for making this possible. Um, and I know that our, our speakers and, um, and panelists will address these issues to the core of it um, and provide the solidarity and confidence that is needed to address these issues. Um, to move on to the next um, representative is Olumude Idou, uh, who, who is with the Africa Youth uh, Initiative on Climate Change and uh, was uh, critical in the partnership uh, that was needed to hold the Africa consultation. Olumide, please over to you. Please Olumide. remember to unmute yourself. I see he's on the call, but he's not uh, on, on, he's uh, still on mute. Okay, while, while we wait for him to unmute, I will quickly then take uh, Sarah Fahin Khan. Um, from uh, our youth adaptation network uh, in South Asia. Sarah. Thank you, Joshua. Assalamualaikum and my greetings to you all. I am Sarah Fahinkhan and I'm currently working at the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAT, uh, Bangladesh, and I'm representing on behalf of the youth adaptation network of South Asia. Uh, I have previously uh, participated in the event which was held uh, day before yesterday. Uh, 
So uh, my firstly, my heartiest gratitude and thanks to all of you for participating in this event, particularly this session, uh, which not only aims to bring a change in our biological environment, but also our social environment. Uh, as it is high time to par partner with our young leaders across the globe to encourage collaboration, resilience, and capacity building, which will ultimately benefit the local communities and will bring a change in the mentality of many. So we know elder Asian people accepting to changes and requirements of the youth is rare and needs to be changed, to be honest. And what could be better than starting off with the youth itself, right? So uh, who are the current leaders as well as has the uh, ability to upskill the generations to come? As climate change intensifies over time, it is quite evident that we youngsters are the ones who are going to face the actual harshness of climate change, causing increased wildfires, flood, drought, erosion of coastal areas, rising temperatures, insect outbreaks, and whatnot, right? So young people of South Asia are tapping into their skills to speak up for climate action, which was prominent in the regional uh, youth consultation of South Asia. Uh, youth from different districts of Bangladesh participated voluntarily and spoke on their difficulties and solutions related to climate change. We know consultancy, uh, uh, we know consistency is the key to progress and amongst the problems discussed, what we mostly, uh, what mostly came up was the lack of consistency. Uh, similarly, uh, speaking of education, education helps to adapt to climate change. Uh, but most people in the disaster prone area have no idea of why these disasters are taking place. Time and experience might have taught many uh, how to adopt, but mitigation is something which could be only taught by experts, uh, particularly climate experts. If these uh, topics are added to the primary level textbooks, maybe then they can take necessary measures to adopt and mitigate climate change from a very young age. On the other hand, uh, change in education uh, related approach is crucial and more practical knowledge is encouraged and was encouraged in the session as well uh, than bookish knowledge. And updated knowledge on climate change is to be provided to the young learners. Talking about advocacy, uh, advocacy requires field experience and workshops over knowledge, which will help in rising uh, awareness and ensuring specific climate change related information. Uh, climate change initiatives need to be implemented in rural and remote areas. Uh, here is where Connect can come in. Connect demands uh, demanded to addressing uh, networking issues and facilitator to uh, guide them. Online campaigns and monitoring of activities could be done from the GCA, but, 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 but there is less availability and limited access of training opportunities in remote and disaster prone areas of Bangladesh and countries like Nepal, Bhutan, etc. So there is very limited or absolutely no accessibility of internet coverage or phone network where meetings like this cannot be arranged. Uh, campaigns and youth training programs is to be done by volunteers and experts by going uh, there physically. Uh, here, youth training program uh, um, and here the youth training programs is to be done by volunteers uh, of GCA uh, by uh, helping them physically going there, right? So by training particular groups on adopting climate change and sending them far off to train other groups and communities and uh, so on and so forth. So this is uh, particularly uh, my take from the South Asian Adaptation Network. Uh, hope I could outline the overall cons uh, consultancy session. So I would like to have a question. I would like to add a question, which is since the uh, South Asian countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan are prone to natural disasters. My question is how GCA is aiming to provide aid for the remote areas of Bangladesh. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Quite a lot of uh, different uh, things. Uh, that has to be addressed by our our senior uh, uh, participants here. Um, I think on I want to repeat a couple of things which I find very very important. Um, one is limited opportunities or even no opportunities at all for communities where the risk is even much higher. And while you were talking, I could see that our colleagues in the South Asia region were nodding their head, 
constantly in support of this. So I'm looking forward to see the responses that comes out of that. And I think that also for Martin COP26 uh, team to really, how do we bring such voices to the COP26 uh, in areas where uh, virtual engagement is probably not even possible when you do virtual uh, events. Thank you uh, for that. I will quickly take uh, Kehal, uh, who is uh, part of the Youth Environment uh, uh, Europe Network. Um, and Kehal uh, and his team have been very supportive and partnering with us at the GCA to hold consultations in Europe. Over to you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I'll try to be fast enough. Um, at Youth Environment Europe, we go to the <laughs> European consultation last week. Fair, it's very clear listening to all the other youth speakers that in Europe, I think we are um, very, very privileged both when it comes to the opportunities that we have and also in the, the, the effects of climate change that we are like uh, exposed to are, are far, far reduced compared to a lot of other regions in the world. Um, but I guess there are always improvements in terms of um, involvement of youth that can be made. Um, but just some of the, the points that were highlighted in our session and um, I'll draw attention to now. So for example, from a European perspective, there are actually quite a lot of different formal dialogues and mechanisms for young people to get involved um, with both national and EU bodies in terms of um, giving a platform to their voice or getting involved in decisions. Um, but one thing that was brought up was how there aren't quite as many opportunities at a local level or for individuals who aren't involved in such big organizations such as YE, or again, for individuals who are entrepreneurs or working in business sectors fighting climate change in terms of all of the business side of things. Um, there are much, much less opportunities available to them in Europe. Um, so that would be one issue to look at in terms of being inclusive and supportive to those smaller levels uh, in terms of creating solutions for adaptation in Europe. Um, and then one of the other uh, issues that was highlighted was how it is so much more empowering for young people to um, be involved in, in workshops or hackathons where they get to basically interact and meet and connect and network with other young people um, rather than some kind of a, a webinar to educate them or to um, have different awards for competitions where they don't really get to interact with anyone else. The, the opportunity to be able to make connections and to, to kind of learn from and co-create solutions with other young people is extremely valuable. So that's another um, point that could be, be brought up and, and certainly expanded on in terms of the work of different organizations in Europe. Um, and then lastly, the one I wanted to raise was, um, I have been very impressed with how GCA has handled uh, involving young perspectives. And as I said, it is something that is, is quite common in Europe. Um, but there was um, quite a, a strong um, voice among the young people at, at our consultation, um, just noting how um, although young people are often included in these conversations, it can often feel that it is in a very tokenistic way um, and that as great as it is to be able to be given these opportunities, um, if it doesn't actually feel like anyone is listening to you and any real action is being taken on anything that you said or there at least leads to any kind of outcomes, um, that can feel very tokenistic and somewhat patronizing. Uh, so I guess my primary question to the, the people on, on the call here today is um, how you might plan to give more power uh, to the voices and decisions of young people at international summits such as COP26 or the Climate Adaptation Summit, um, or at least find better ways to, to incorporate their perspectives in a way that isn't so tokenistic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kehal. Uh, I saw Mike, uh, Karina, Adriana all nodding their head. Uh, I know Matt and his team are also taking note of this in terms of engagement um, towards bigger conferences at the international level. And I think this also sides with a comment I saw in the, in the chat box from um, Cherub Soy, where she was also talking about how to really bring in indigenous uh, knowledge towards the climate adaptation policies, said that we have a bottom-up approach and then a top-down approach. So these questions will be answered. Now, finally, uh, we have our representative from Africa, uh, Olumide Idowu, who was part of the Africa consultation. And he will quickly talk about what were the key messages of the consultation as well as the questions that we will throw to our, our panelists here to answer. Olumide, over to you. Okay, thank you everyone. I hope you can hear me very well, right? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for giving me this opportunity to also 
share a little bit of a uh, point from Africa uh, after our consultation. Uh, we're able to get like three key outputs, which I think is very, very important for everybody to also actually to listen to uh, what we're saying. First and foremost, my name is Olumide. I'm, I'm the Communication Director for African Unity for Climate Change. And um, our aim is, is, is like an umbrella body. Hello. Yes, then we have we have a background sound, so please hold on. Great. Please on. Yeah, a very strong background there. Uh, background noise. It's not my place. I can hear you very. I don't have any background noise. Okay, great. Please proceed. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, better now. Please proceed. Yeah. Okay. So, like I said, uh, African Unity for Climate Yeah. It's the network umbrella of young people in Africa working on civil society across all of Africa. But this actually gets from our conversation, one of these new, to understand the issue about climate change because awareness about it, that is one of the key strong uh, And the second one, which everybody always talk about. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Would you mind switching the camera off? just to try uh, if the connection will be better. If you just switch your camera off and we'll see if we can hear you better. Uh, okay. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. so the first point I raise, the first point I raise here is uh, the need for capacity building for young people to understand the issue about climate change because awareness about the problem, we enhance the chances of adaptation and people will be able to have more understanding. Because if you see, uh, I don't know whether uh, from your, from the survey we filled when we started, the last part is actually talking about how do we actually understand adaptation and which this is one of the key conversation for African youth to actually get the learning of adaptation strategy. Then the second point is, like I said, African youth, we are looking towards, because of the uh, job unemployment, we talk about investment opportunity around the economic side of the SDGs. So I'm using that, the economic dimension of the SDGs. So we are looking at financial support to support the youth adaptation initiatives that can help young people, that can help you to actually drive that sustainable change and build back better for economic growth. Then the last one is inclusion in the development and implementation of our national strategy plan, adaptation plan, because most of our adaptation plan in Africa needs a lot of implementation. Though we have a lot of fantastic policies, fantastic idea on ground, but how can we make sure that implementation of this national adaptation plan is being uh, uh, worked on so that it's going to make a good opening grad for young people to work effectively and to enjoy the issue of our build back better, green recovery and adaptation strategy. So those are the key strong uh, uh, output. And I think these are the things that we want our global leaders, African leaders to start looking at how they can mainstream investment opportunity for young people when it comes to adaptation issues. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Olumide. Um, for, for laying out these really fantastic points on education, investments, uh, and inclusion into the policy and implementation process. Um, I mean, being at the consultation myself and being part of the other consultations, um, I remember one comment someone made was, we always hear there is a project by the government, but we never really know what exactly it is, or we don't really understand what these projects are, but there are always reports on projects uh, uh, during the conferences, and we don't know what this really means. Uh, and how we can be part of that. And I think this is something that I'll be looking forward to hearing responses 
um, from from our GCA colleagues uh, and also the COP26 team to really um, provide support and uh, remarks on this. So let's get into getting responses and beginning the dialogue and interaction. Um, I will, first of all, uh, want to quickly um, introduce Mike, Karina, and Matt. So Mike is, the, um, is working with the GCA, Karina also with the GCA leading the private sector initiatives there, and Matt is the engagement and partnership lead for COP26. Mike will start by introducing himself and will give remarks and responses to the questions that have been raised, but also talk about the GCA's work. Mike, please. Hi, Josh, and hi, everyone. And first of all, let me just say a big uh, thank you to everyone um, for joining today's session, for Josh for kind of um, moderating it so kind of expertly, and to kind of our hosts at IIDD for putting on uh, CBA 14, because it's a great opportunity to have these types of uh, conversations. I'm going to try and keep my remarks super short, because there are something like 70, 80 folks on the line. It's meant to be a the, the, the dialogue so me just killing you by powerpoint is not going to um energize it's not going to inform it's not going to take the conversation forward so what i'd like to do is very briefly outline who the gca are what our plans are briefly on kind of youth leadership in doing so try to answer some of the questions put forward apologize if i can't answer them all but some of them actually will require me to have probably an hour in myself just to kind of answer good because those are good questions um but also encourage folks to use the chat function because um such as the um the way of zoom is that only one person can talk at the same time there's no so if where but it's, I, i've already seen some great ideas i've made some notes um so if, if i don't respond to them now i'm making notes and you know we're going to take these ideas back and kind of really kind of use them to inform our work at least and i'm sure that um my colleagues from uh, the COP26 team would be um, thinking exactly the same. Um, so I'm going to ask the colleagues running the Zoom to share my screen, which is great. Thanks so much, Lynn. We'll share their screen, my PowerPoint. Um, yeah, if you could just go on to the next slide, uh, Lynn. Thanks so much. Um, so the slide will soon move on, I hope, uh, to um, show uh, uh, very briefly kind of who the Global Centre on Adaptation is. We're an international organisation hosted by the Netherlands, um, set up just a few years ago um, um, with offices kind of um, headquartered in Rotterdam, an office in the north of the country in the Netherlands, but also with offices now in Beijing. Dhaka and Abidjan, um, so covering South Asia, Africa, and China. Some of you may have come across the Global Commission on Adaptation. Um, if you can go into the next slide, uh, please, Lynn. The um, Global Commission on Adaptation was set up, chaired by Ban Ki-moon, Bill Gates, Christina Georgieva. Um, it's a kind of time-bound project to really kind of accelerate kind of the political kind of visibility and do what folks were just saying on the call now about awareness raising, raising the awareness level at the kind of the highest political kind of policy making level about why adaptation is so important. Um, and the Global Commission released a report uh, last September at the kind of um, opening of the UN General Assembly with heads of states and the other commission members there kind of really kind of focusing in on kind of why adaptation is not just um, urgent and needed, but also on the kind of opportunities and um, as um, Alume Day said, um, bringing out the kind of the economic the benefits of adapting now, because if we leave it too late, then actually the costs are going to kind of rise um, exponentially. Um, and so the Adaptation um, Commission not only came out of this report, we could have made the case, but also wanted to kind of take forward and kind of enact action on this um, agenda so it's not just enough to write a report and can kind of leave it on the shelf and that's it you've also got to put forward uh, recommendations and action and that's where the global center on adaptation um comes in uh, next slide please Lynn. uh which is uh, we've been set up to act as a solutions broker there's a lot of great work going on around the world a lot of great work which your organizations are already doing yourself a lot of great work by governments, by community organizations, by companies, but actually 
it's, a, it's not enough, and B, there's uh, simply not enough of it is being shared with each other. Um, and so as a solutions broker, we can bring together these various stakeholders, whether on programs and action, agenda setting and advocacy, or knowledge and acceleration to kind of um, make the changes which we feel are necessary to really kind of bring adaptation to the level that is needed. And we, the kind of free revolution that we talk about in this space is a revolution in understanding. So make sure that people uh, are aware and understand much better kind of what is needed uh, for adaptation, a revolution in planning, so that these um, risks of, of the climate impacts in the coming years are uh, better understood and incorporated into planning for businesses, for companies, for um, local governments, for community organizations, um, that these risks are better understood and therefore um, taken into consideration when making decisions and a revolution in finance because um, as folks will know on this call certain promises were made about um, supporting communities already feeling the impacts of um, climate change um, as part of the Paris Agreement and kind of those finance flows currently just aren't happening at the scale that is needed so um, as um, a solutions broker we help kind of find those um, solutions that are out there, those needs that are unmet, and try to connect them with those kind of governments and uh, donor organisations that are helping to um, and want to um, support them. Um, and Ban Ki-moon is on the left because he's the chair of our board too. So he's uh, not only the, uh, the, the chair of the commission, but the chair of the, the Global Centre on Adaptation too. Missing from this slide is any mention of youth. And I think that's for one good reason. I mean, you, you could put youth in civil society organizations, but actually we don't want to pigeonhole youth in any one area because if you go into the next slide, the goal of our youth program is to make youth central in driving that adaptation agenda and implementation. We want to put young people wherever we work and in whatever we do involve the perspectives um, of young people. On the right-hand side is uh, some of these projects which we're going either setting up now, like the Youth Adaptation Network, which I'm very glad that colleagues um, just spoke about um, just now, but also these other projects to be launched um, over the coming months, including a solutions challenge. So um, I hope responding to some of what Kyle said about not just um, giving young people a seat at the table, but also allowing them to interact with others in, an inter kind of in a kind of positive collaborative sense to kind of really um, and kind of to utilize the kind of energy and ideas of young people and to connect them together so kind of the sum is greater than the past. Um, there's also kind of a scheme placing kind of young, the uh, winners of that challenge within the Global Center, so the kind of hands-on experience on kind of working in this space, not just with us, but with our partners, and I'll kind of ask Karina to say a bit more about that um, after me. And also a big piece on education, because I mean, this came out very strongly um, in the questions uh, before. Education in the broadest possible sense. So yes, there'll be online kind of resources and materials and being led by our knowledge and science hub. But also it's the capacity building, which uh, folks spoke about both in the, um, the chat on the side and uh, in the questions earlier. Um, and also, and this is where I'm really keen to hear the ideas of um, everyone on this call, is kind of how do we provide education and awareness raising and skills training in a way which reaches those who otherwise don't have a chance to take part in these. Um, We've had a few ideas our side about kind of training young people to then go out into the rural areas where they live and so they become the agents of change themselves. So it's very much placing young people driving out of their agenda. But I'm really keen to hear the experiences and views of kind of those on this call as to kind of how we can make education and awareness raising as accessible and as effective as it needs to be. I think that's my last slide. Which I, which I hope kind of uh, kept things as short as it needs to be. So, um, Lynn, if you could maybe kind of stop sharing now, and let me just quickly look through my notes to check whether there was any questions, big burning questions there, which I didn't answer. 
Um, I mean, I'll just say thank you first to Rasha, Chai, Sada, Kayo, and uh, Arumide, because uh, as I said, your questions were excellent. Um, I, I think I've said as much as I can at this stage, so I'll just pass over to Karina. And as I said, I'm really keen to kind of have this conversation in, in the kind of time that we have and, um, and for this to be a start for kind of more such uh, conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Karina, please. Thanks. I love your background. It's just absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was really interesting and I won't take too much time either because there's many on this call I would like to hear from. Um, I, I, and um, uh, I wish we had a whole day, but uh, I guess even if we had a whole day, I probably wouldn't have the answers to some of these questions because they're just too much and I'm not sitting on some of those funds myself, but I think just as, just as both Rasha and Sai and I think all of you were, were talking about is how interlinked the social and the environmental challenges are. Uh, I mean, uh, climate change, migration, which there was a lot on in the chat box, indigenous rights, human rights, jobs, investment, education and solutions. It's all, it's all really complex, interrelated, cross-border, uh, challenges where solutions vary between different regions and, uh, and, and no, no stakeholder can solve almost any of these on their own. So it really, it, 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 you, you keep coming back to this kind of collaboration, partnerships, uh, public, private, uh, government, private sector, academia working together and, and, and I think the youth has a really important role together with NGOs, civil society, etc. to push. Um, to keep pushing for solutions, keep pushing your questions. But I think it's important, I worked a lot with the private sector and, and there you do play a very important role together with the consumers and civil society in pushing companies to do more because they could be doing so much more. But I think it's also important, I'm derailing a bit, I'll come back to the try. <laughs> it's also important to know who your friends are. So many times the sustainability heads in companies are young people's and civil society people's friends because they are pushing inside a company so push and have knowledge behind what you say and do so that you also uh, give roses when when good things are done so to speak and that you, uh, you put your money where your mouth is when you buy brands when you buy things and make a big fuss about it on social media why you choose one and not the other etc you can have a lot of impact there because companies listen more and more on that. But anyway, back to the kind of social and environmental and the interrelatedness of all these challenges and the solutions. Uh, for the first time in ever, we have a, a, a joint roadmap in the world in the SDGs. So I also think it's important to, to link the work you do back to the SDGs, as we do at the GCA as well. We kind of anchor all the things we do in the SDG agenda, because the good thing with that is even if it's so broad and impossible and all the rest, it's some, somewhere where everyone working in this space can plug in what they do, so to speak. And you can go back and you demand things and you link it to the SDGs. Um, uh, and, and so back to the GCA and business being an important piece of the puzzle, both when it comes to the business is important uh, for the problems, <laughs> But they're also important for the solutions in that some of the solutions we just need technological innovations we need innovative business models we need uh, their reach we need their investment we need jobs etc so uh, we are pushing a lot at the gca and trying to find ways to encourage uh, business to work more on resilience and adaptation uh, uh, and it is quite it's a bit it, it's a bit of a new area. A, a lot of companies are very engaged in the climate change mitigation space, more and more net zero strategies, uh, more and more um, uh, reducing emissions strategies. The big companies have them and more. it's becoming more and more mainstream. Resilience and adaptation is starting up. So for the youth, oh, I'm speaking too long, for the youth, last one. So for the youth leadership program, what, uh, what we're trying to do is invite companies, we're going out with invitation out to 100 CEOs in companies, asking them to become youth leadership partners, which means uh, they would uh, be part of helping to um, 
judge and also give advice and scale up some of the innovative solutions that comes out of the solutions challenge. Uh, they will host, uh, if they agree, we are trying to get this to happen, host uh, winners of the solutions challenge in their company uh, as an uh, uh, stash, what do you call it, internship. Uh, uh, we also want them to send young staff to GCAs to be in part of the same intern program. So we open the channel for dialogue because the good thing, we want them to hear your ideas, your questions, your solutions. and. And we want you to, we want everyone to learn from each other and build on coming back to my final world, which is what I spent my whole career on, is the trying to make the different sides work together, the collaboration, partnerships, joint definition of problems, joint definition of success, joint roadmaps, and, and trying to move together uh, and um, still needing to be pushed by activists as yourself. Uh, and it is so true as, um, very last word. Uh, it is so true. Where, where, where are you now? Uh, I said, no, who was he saying that? <clears throat> no, one of you was saying that you, uh, that you are, you inheriting the planet and all the climate change issues that uh, previous generations, especially ours, have created. And that is very true. Uh, and and you're in your full right to push for things to change fast. Thanks. Thank you very much, Karina. Um, I'm, I'm just going to pick a couple of things which I hope will make Olumide very happy uh, um, and others who also hammered on the point of creating opportunities um, in terms of investments and also on the path of sort of um, uh, uh, training programs. And Karina, thanks a lot for emphasizing the work you are doing now to bring in enough uh, private sector partnership to allow the GCA to provide enough opportunity, opportunities for young people and also to sort of uh, polish the ideas uh, and the innovative uh, innovation that they are developing uh, to make it uh, uh, possible to, to move towards idea to, to implementation. So thanks a lot for that, Karina, um, as well as, of course, that they need to increase advocacy uh, um, on, on the last point. So really great. Mats, I'm looking at you now uh, as, as the last speaker for this, for this session. Um, what do you have to say? Yeah. Hello, Josh, uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. Just to, um, to say so, my uh, colleague uh, Nikita is on the call as well. We're both from the COP unit in the UK um, and are in the team in the UK government responsible for coordinating work towards the COP. It's been, it's been fantastic hearing all of the, the thoughts, comments so far, um, and those on the chat as well, as Mike was saying, and uh, Karina as well, very keen to, sort of keep the space for discussion and dialogue rather than try and fill up uh, the time myself here. Um, I'm taking notes as I go and very keen that this is a start of a dialogue that uh, that we can have as, as the UK presidency going into COP26. Um, and I very much sort of support the themes around collaboration, partnership working, absolutely, you know, see that as a critical part of the lead up to COP. I thought I'd just say just a very short bit on the UK's kind of priority leading into COP and then a bit about how we would like to work with a range of, uh, of youth organizations, young people, and pick up on some of the, the great sort of questions that have been added, uh, asked here. Um, I mean, the overall approach that the UK's got is I'd, I'd emphasise ambition and inclusion as the sort of two key elements of our approach to the um, to COP26. Uh, we know that we have to approach the, the presidency in a fair and inclusive way to get the most sustainable outcomes. Uh, I think, as, as others have said, we have to be ambitious. We have to be ambitious because we're off track to meet the Paris goals. We need national governments to come forward with much stronger um, national commitments uh, and NDC plans. Uh, we need them to be three to five times greater than they are now. So we're asking all countries to come forward with more structuring plans. Uh, and that's where we want to work with partnerships, you know, from states, cities, business. Uh, but young people have a huge voice here in uh, in raising the pressure on national governments to come forward with more structuring uh, uh, plans themselves. And we have to be more ambitious because, as, as many people here have already been saying, the impacts are, are absolutely being felt now of climate change, 
you know, the last five years have been hottest on record. Um, and we're seeing impacts right the way across the world with the most vulnerable communities affected most and young people affected uh, the most. Um, so adaptation and resilience is a priority for the UK presidency. And that includes the commitment to the 100 billion uh, climate finance. That includes driving forward the, the work from the Young Cast Call for Action last year. A lot of fantastic work from Egypt, Bangladesh, Netherlands, Malawi, St. Lucia and others. We're very keen to keep pushing that forward to tangible um, progress um, and, and a focus on disaster preparedness and the response to natural disasters. So as presidency, we in the UK will work very closely with the UF, UNFCCC, with Chile, Italy uh, and a wide range of state and non-state actors. The engagement with non-state is, is incredibly important um, and so to make it a genuinely inclusive and whole of society COP, that's where we need to link in with the various youth groups, the full range of young people across the, across the world and I, I think the, the challenge uh, from Cathal to, you know, this cannot be tokenistic, this needs to be very genuinely amplifying and showcasing the solutions and I, I love the focus that a lot of speakers have had on solutions um, and the opportunities for solutions that are being led by young people. You know, we're very keen to, to learn from the experience that a lot of you have had engaging with COPs in the past about how we can do that and what the, the best ways that we can do to give you the, uh, the capacity to be able to showcase those, those solutions. Um, I mean, we're working, some of the practical things we're doing as the presidency, we're working with the Italian government uh, who will be hosting the, the youth event and pre-COP in Milan. Um, and that will bring together a 400 or so delegates uh, just ahead of COP26. Uh, the uh, COP president designate, so Alok Sharma, he's established a youth and civil society roundtable. That's going to be co-chaired by two young people. So uh, we're using that as one of the routes for engaging with uh, uh, civil society in our plans. We're working with Youngo um, and UNFCCC on, on our preparations right from the you know, the practicalities of putting on the event itself and having ensuring access for all communities. Josh, your question about how we ensure participation, you know, when virtual engagement is not possible for all is a, is a very, very strong one and one we are very alert to um, and is why we are, uh, we are planning towards a, a physical COP based in Glasgow where the engagement of indigenous communities and young people is incredibly important. We'll obviously try and learn lessons from the use of virtual as well, uh, so we can augment uh, and, and make it even more, uh, even more accessible. So um, I think, I mean, I heard some of the, the questions as well, raising challenges around access to finance, um, which, uh, uh, so access right to the local kind of levels of climate finance, that's incredibly important. It's something we hear very strongly. Uh, and the UK is doing some specific things around, for example, the Life AR programme, um, but more widely we're, we're committed to work with donors, uh, so donor countries with the multilateral development banks and national development banks, the various climate funds to make sure that finance is more accessible. Um, and, uh, and some questions around access to education, again, we'll work very closely with the Action for Climate Empowerment and the work around natural, uh, national strategies on that, but really, really important challenge and where we can be doing more, please just want to hear from your experiences. So uh, just a few things picking up there from, from the comments. Um, and again, thanks very much for asking me and Nikita to be part of this. Uh, we're really keen to keep this going as a dialogue and, and really to learn from the experiences you've had about, about how to make these international events and COPs uh, genuinely inclusive. Thank you. Great, thank you very, very much, uh, Max, for, for that excellent remarks. I will just take some few minutes to give sort of a summary of what I've heard so far from um, our, our panelists. And afterwards, we get into a dialogue um, where we'll be looking at participants here to provide solutions and sort of talk about how you will see things moving forward. So then sort of advise uh, the COP26 in the GC and other organizations here 
who are, are hoping to or put in their efforts and, and resources to put young people at the heart of their work. And you can already see Mike already put some questions uh, um, in the chat, which is supposed to help you start thinking around solutions that you can offer. I see hands raised. Ahmed Abdi, I see your hand raised. I'm gonna come to you in a minute. Um, but before we move on, this is what we've had so far. So Mike started by giving an overview of the commitment and dedication of the GCA, the team behind it, as well as the Global Commission on Adaptation and the work they've done over the past two years with key focus on education advocacy, connect uh, um, and innovate uh, with focus again on not just connecting young people to young people, but also putting young people in touch with policymakers and influencers. And this is something that uh, the GCA is working on. Uh, quickly also talking around how it's not just youth as a, a different thing outside of the work of the GCA, but rather making it part of the overall work. And typically many organizations will have a youth program, which is separate from the work they do. And I really like that in this case, it's more central to all the activities. So thanks for that, Mike. Uh, quickly to Karina mention how she is putting in a lot of effort to bring in private sector partners. You mentioned about sort of 100 companies coming in, providing spaces for young people to come and learn from these companies, but also the company providing the space to train young people. And I think that really corresponds to the remarks we received from South Asia, from Africa, uh, and also from Europe around providing resources and space where people can have access to opportunities uh, and opportunities that are not just tokenizing them, but really giving them the skills to, to move towards implementation. So that was really awesome. Um, then we had uh, Matt who talked about um, how the COP26 team is making themselves ready for all the concerns you have around youth engagement. What I really like is also that he is here together with Nikita and the team to listen to what you think should be the best approach. But more significantly, he's made it very concrete that it's not just sort of um, meeting with people who have the means to, but again, providing space for indigenous communities and other minorities to be present at the COP to be able to interact physically, which I think is very, very important for the audience here. There are still questions which are not resolved yet, and I'm very keen on this. And I know there are no straight answers to some of these questions, but I'm looking at the chat, I'm looking at the conversations that are happening, and I'm picking on two things which are very, very critical. And I think youth participants here will perhaps have some responses to this. The issue of migration, refugee crisis, political instability, and how the climate adaptation pr process itself and climate engagement can help resolve these issues. So how do we link migration, political instability, refugee crisis to the work that the climate adaptation community, and this is not just a question to GCA or just a question to COP26, but also to everyone. Quickly, I will introduce Adriana Valenzuela, who have a long history with the UNFCCC. If you have anything about UNFCCC, you have her here, you can shoot at her and she will try to respond to that. But Adriana's role uh, today is to help us think about or help you to really talk about your best practices to provide responses to her. And so she'll be asking about some challenges she has seen with youth engagement over her long years of working with the UNFCCC and try to get you to provide her and the audience here what you think should be done. And to do that, Adriana will go on with her questions. Also, Mike already put some questions in the chat. We're going to have a format as to how people respond to the questions, if you want to do this verbally. So um, the format is we're going to have um, selected individuals, Desmond and Lugnua within the South Southern African region, Nuyang Rai, South Asia, also indigenous community representative, Nishad from the Middle East, and Manal Bidar from North Africa. So these four individuals who give their remarks, I've noted uh, um, Ahmad, who has uh, his hands raised, and also a colleague from India, uh, um, uh, Tashwan, who is also uh, going to give remarks. So Adrana, please over to you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Joshua. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. As uh, Joshua mentioned, I joined the UNFCC Secretariat uh, seven years ago, and I have been managing the agenda on action for climate empowerment that is about education, training, public awareness, public access to information, public participation, and international cooperation. But also as part of this agenda, youth empowerment is central. 
Uh, I am delighted also to see uh, Mike and uh, the other colleagues from GCA, as well, Matt, uh, from the upcoming COP26 presidency. Before that, I move to the questions. Uh, let me just share very briefly what has happened in the UNFCCC process and how you have helped to shape this international agenda. The Paris Agreement uh, is this universal agenda that provides the general framework about what needs to be done on climate change. And this universal agenda highlights the importance to promote not only mitigation, but also adaptation. And the Paris Agreement recognized one of the key principles is intergenerational equity. And also, Article 12 of the Paris Agreement recognized that if we don't raise awareness, if we don't empower every person to take part of the solution, we will not be able to address the, the, this challenge. Climate change is one of the biggest challenges, but also provides an opportunity. And as you said, there are many questions. And the questions, uh, the responses will be uh, joint co-design, what we can do. Also, 2020 is a very crucial year. Why? Because, as Matt said, parties are reviewing the national determinate contributions that are action plans. And at COP24 in Katowice, the parties agree the Katowice package, that is the action plan for the Paris Agreement. And this decision highlights the importance of youth participation in climate action and also invite countries to include the topics of education and training, public awareness, public access to information as part of the national determinate contributions, as part of the national adaptation plans, but also any other climate uh, policy. And we have seen many youth organizations and youth leaders participating at the national level to try to contribute and to update this agenda. One of the, the, the key points is that the COP25 presidency, Chile, include these elements and they are going to design this national strategy. But also, uh, 2020 is a crucial year because there is a global program uh, on ACE and governments are reviewing this, goal, this global program and they are going to define a global program to be adopted next year uh, at COP26. And it's about what can we do to raise awareness, to promote uh, climate education, to make information available, and how uh, youth can contribute in this process. Then I am delighted to be here. And I think that you, you have the passion, the creativity, and you also are the ones that are implementing solutions at all levels. And for that, I would like to, to get back to you, uh, to know a bit more about what good practices do you know, either in your city, in your country, or also you can be aware of other good practices in other countries around the world. Then what good practices do you know about public engagement, especially engaging youth as part of the climate solutions. The second question that I have uh, for all of you, uh, and then you just start thinking, is what are the, the, the challenges that you are facing? We know that you are passionate. We know that you have, you want to participate, but what challenges are you facing when you try to lead climate action? And the third question, and maybe the most important, is what do you need? And we heard already, we need education, we need capacity building, but what more do you need to really become this agent of change and lead adaptation solutions in, uh, in your communities, in your cities, and in your countries? Then three questions, good practices, challenges, and also your needs. Then over to you, Joshua. Well, thanks very much, Adriana. Very concrete questions. I'm not going to take any further time. I'm going to pass it on to the, 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 the lineup of you speakers who are going to contribute to this. So quickly to you, Desmond, um, you can choose to answer any of these three key questions. Uh, uh, and afterwards, I will take Nurang. And I would also like to say that beyond these three questions, there were also concrete questions again from Mike, which were also in the chat. And if you have responses to this as well, you can please uh, respond to that. Desmond, over to you. Thank you very much, Joshua. Uh, I'm uh, really glad to be here and uh, to, to meet everyone here. Uh, with respect to these questions, I think that 
we we when it comes to the issue of climate adaptation we probably would not have so many of success stories to share but then when you look at the micro level we have seen examples of how especially the private sector have succeeded by integrating uh, young people into their leadership structure, integrating young people into how they design and implement projects. And then with time, they do not need to do so much work to, 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 to actually provide uh, the next steps. But then that is also where another missing gap is because when it comes to uh, policy level, uh, we, we realize that like it is already noted, private sector, young people are kind of missing at the, uh, the formulation stage, which is very crucial because if they are missing at the formulation stage and a lot of young people are scattered around in every country implementing and doing education, it, it means that they, they are not able to even do it according to what national plan has. And, and, and that is where I think we need to look at. Uh, when it comes to youth engagement, like Mike uh, questioned first, uh, I think that if you want to engage young people effectively and inclusively, we first of all, one thing, one, one, one option is to train a, a number of young people from different communities and give them the opportunity to, to go back and also further train their colleagues and keep the momentum on. But this can only happen with commitment. But even on top of that, what is also required is to find a very strategic way to streamline young people into the national policy making process because that is where the main I see the, 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 the main gap. When we look at the NDCs of sub Saharan African countries, we realize that the processes, most of the processes were engaged at the sector level, and these sector levels do not have young people among them. So how do you get the young people include their voices? So even if we train these young people and they have the confidence to uh, do an independent consultation, their work might not be seen credible by national leaders because they are not in the structure where these decisions are taken. And I think uh, one uh, last thing that I would like to, to talk about is when it comes to um, the issue of uh, how to ensure that community level implementation happens and then it can uh, they, they can trickle down to support the prevention of migration, climate-related uh, migration and wars. The thing is that we need to look at the current problems and convert them into solutions. If you realize so many of the youth and the youth networks that are scattered around, what they do is to try to digitalize, they are trying to, to innovate, some of them are convert, uh, improving soil biodiversity, and some of them are converting so many of the uh, resources that are discarded into goods that can be used because uh, climate change has affected uh, their, their areas of living. So let's look into how do we make sure that we, we identify these organizations and then capitalize on these initiatives that are originated or that are in, in uh, that, that, that they themselves initiated. And then we give them the opportunity to explore more and to expand. I think with this, we, we might have a good start. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, that's one Very concrete points. Um, I'm gonna give an overview later on. I'm trying to make sure we give enough room for people to really speak. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next speaker. Nyang Rai, South Asia, uh, Indigenous representative of the Youth Adaptation Network. Please go ahead. Um, thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nyang Rai. I'm a 19-year-old BSc Agriculture student, and I'm currently serving as a program intern at YFEED Foundation, um, also Youth for Environment Education and Development Foundation, um, which is um, uh, an organization that specially focuses on indigenous communities, women, children, as primary stakeholders for the community. Um, so I will try to answer the question given by Adriana with um, trying to focus especially on the indigenous community. 
So indigenous communities, um, they live in harmony with nature and depend upon agriculture as the main occupation. So definitely um, climate, uh, climate change and the, all the crisis has affected all the groups equally, but I believe it is the indigenous community that, uh, that are more affected, that are adversely affected by it. So um, uh, the different generations in the indigenous community, they have different wants, different priorities and different needs. So um, I studied uh, the research, one of the research um, done by done at McGill University, um, which said uh, that um, when we look at, uh, when we research from the bottom up community, you, rea you realize the concern uh, when you um, bottom, top bottom position, one might ask how will a two degree climate change affect indigenous community? Whereas when you are researching from bottom, bottom to up community, you realize the concern might be smaller than a two degree change, like what will happen to their crops when the rain is delayed by a week. Um, so a week or two delays in the rain might not affect so much in the urban areas, the urban farmers, but the, a week delay in the, in the rain for the indigenous farmers, it affects them adversely. They depend upon traditional farming in the 21st century modern world and um, the delay in the week affects their crops, which is their livelihood. It affects the whole year. Um, so think about how that delay affects their whole year. With poor income, they can barely live, uh, barely make their living. And uh, like um, Adriana already said, quality education. Uh, we must focus on quality education, but that is not the only answer. Um, policy making. So we must, um, I believe, like we must include indigenous community to in uh, policy making, um, in research, uh, research and everything. Like um, since indigenous community, they um, they work closely with uh, environment. They are close uh, with environment, so they know more about the minute changes happening in the environment, they can contribute more. Since their whole life depends upon, um, su since they sustain their whole life upon agriculture and um, the resources around them, the flora and fauna around them, um, I believe they will be more cautious, they will be more helpful in researching, which might help degrade um, climate crisis, which might help reduce climate crisis. Um, so that is it, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Uh, very useful uh, for the conversation. Quickly, I will take Nisha uh, Shafi from the Middle East, Arab Youth Climate Network. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Josh, thank you, Anna. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak from here from the Arab country. I just want to be very precise in terms of adaptation. Like I mentioned during the consultation, the young people are very far away from the real conversation. Well, we need to bring more young people in this part of the world. Adaptation is not a key the component discussed even in the, even in the climate sphere. Uh, in terms of even the government capacity building, there's a lot has to be done. And I think even our government conversation are far away from adaptation. Uh, so I think um, uh, young people have a great uh, way to engage and uh, or, um, getting into young people like Arab Islam and Qatar would be a great way to engage with the local community that uh, adds advantage because we are uh, very much connected with the local community. Uh, in terms of um, um, good practices, I would say engaging community-based uh, activities would be a great way engaging in the Gulf Arab countries where, you know, most of the things are done by government, community doesn't play a crucial role. So this was also I shared in, during our conversation, during the uh, adaptation consultation that um, we are left out because they feel it's a government engagement, which is now falling apart. I mean, in the Gulf countries, you can see that the government feels young people and community has a great role to play in terms of environment and climate change. Uh, and moving on to how you can do, uh, uh, you know, it's not only capacity building and funding and also uh, long term, uh, you know, stock taking of what has been done because some of the time you start program and you don't know what, what has been achieved so far. So there is no stock taking uh, sort of any program uh, in the past. So that would be a key objective to find out what has been done end of the year or probably a year around a survey or something like that should be done. Uh, beyond that, I think engaging governments uh, uh, when it comes to the Gulf states, especially the GCC countries, I believe um, uh, pushing the governments to engage with young people will be a key objective. Even from the COP26 team, I, I would think or the Italian embassy or, you know, through their sub-government, you know, embassies can be engaging young people here uh, because uh, civil society space are very low in our country. So that would be a great way to keep the programs going on and engagement at youth level. 
that's it. Thank you very much, Nisha. Thank you very much. Quickly, I really like the point on long-term stock taking. That is largely missing in all the youth work that has been happening. It's very, very difficult to keep track on who came last year, what did they say, who is saying what this year, how do we make sure that there's consistency. So really great point on that, Nisha. Really thanks for that. Quickly, uh, let me take Manal Bida from the Africa Youth Climate Hub, representing the North Africa uh, region as well. Manal. Thank you, Joshua. First, I would like to thank you all, to thank the GCA for organizing this wonderful event. Let me first uh, express how grateful, how thankful, and how, how honored I am here to be here among you today. Uh, I was very inspired by the youth interventions earlier at the, at the beginning of the session, and even uh, I was really inspired by the interventions in the chat in the comments. It is always heartwarming to see that young people are taking the lead for action. Uh, I would like to start off my intervention and make it very short by a quote I heard from an Nigerian colleague a few months ago. He said, it always seems that the, the least protected are always the most affected. And I totally agree with that. The African continent is currently the most affected by climate change and will be the most affected by it in the years to come. But far from just being victims, young people here in Africa are taking the lead for action. They are driving their communities and they are driving the climate adaptation agenda. I personally have witnessed that many, many times. And recently, two weeks ago, I had the honor to facilitate the French session of the webinar organized by the GCA to launch the, uh, the Youth Adaptation Network in Africa. And I was truly surprised and very shocked to see that African, African youth are driving actions despite the financial problems, lack of technology, lack of capacity buildings, and so on. Uh, today, I would like also to propose solutions uh, some solution I see that can solve and that can enhance uh, youth participation and involvement in climate change adaptation. Uh, first, I would like to um, emphasize on education. Climate change should be included in education. Personally, I would never ever get involved in climate action if I had not learned about it in the school, in elementary school when I was eight years old. I knew about climate change and since then I have been, I have been interested by it and I have get, got involved. And if I had not studied about that at that time, I would perhaps never get involved in climate action adaptation and so on. Second thing, I would like also to propose a solution in terms of uh, policy making and decision making. Perhaps the problem that is currently happening in North Africa and also in other parts of the world is the lack of trust and communication between governments and young people. We see that governments are still not trusting young people in terms of decision making and so on. And here the solution for me, I wouldn't, I, I don't blame governments or adults for doing that because Every one of us would not risk something new, but the solution here is, is, to, is in the hands of young people. We are currently showing that we're strong, and if we continue our action just like this, if we continue and show the governments and the adults and the decision makers and national leaders that we can make decisions, that we are able to do that, and that we are strong enough to make the right and the very correct decisions, then for sure, for that trust and that communication will increase by time. Uh, that was it. I really hope uh, that was kind of helpful. And thank you again for organizing this wonderful event. It was truly a pleasure to be here among you. Thank you very, very much, Mana. That was really inspirational uh, and awesome uh, representing the Africa region and the consultations that took place. Really appreciate that. Quickly, I will take Tapaswani, uh, who is from India and wants to really emphasize on the need for research. Uh, quickly to you. Um, hello everyone, I'm Tapaswini Sharma from India and I'm a member of Yango and the Youth Adaptation Network. Um, we, are, we are all the world is um, experiencing the effects of climate change and so is India and in the climate change report it was also mentioned that in the past few decades the temperature has increased by 0 0.7 degrees Celsius and this will continue to increase if we do not uh, take appropriate action now. Um, and this increase in temperature is also affecting food security, the available of, uh, availability of freshwater resources, and even public health. Um, and so I believe that uh, in order to efficiently combat climate change, we need new innovations. And new innovations best come from young people, students, and the youth. And so um, a, lot of, a lot of young students don't even have the access to internet. 
So I was um, the question that I have is how do you plan to reach out to these students? And um, one proposal that I would that I also have uh, as being a research oriented student, I believe that all students should be involved in um, major minor research projects to help them get a better um, perspective and a better um, look on what is exactly happening in the world in terms of climate change. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Paswani. Um, I'm very mindful of time and we're very limited on time right now, even though we have still a lot to talk about. What I'm going to do is that please use the chat function and put in a lot of your ideas as much as possible. For the next five minutes before we wrap up the conversation and jump off, I'm going to sort of talk about some critical things which have come up, which will also make young, the, the youth speakers here really see what the thing and what could happen next. We had a lot of conversation around education, train of trainers, sort of getting people to represent at the community level and expand on ideas. This is really brilliant. I know the GCA Youth Adaptation Network has a strategy in place which look into issues. Um, so Mike, if you'd want to sort of highlight this a little bit, please, uh, you can do so in a few seconds. What I'm also trying to do is, I know that we have other stakeholders on the call. I see WWF uh, uh, Netherlands. I know IIED reps are here. I know ICAD reps are here. I'm going to open up the floor a few minutes for these other institutions. If you have anything to say to sort of contribute to the conversation on how we address these issues, that would be really, really brilliant. And then we'll take final words and we will be out of here. So please mind with us uh, for the next five minutes so we can do this. Um, and uh, thanks to Karina uh, and, and Matt who joined us earlier and had to leave because of the time. Quickly, Mike, you want to mention or talk quickly about what GC is going to do about this train of trainers toolkit idea, adaptation champions? Yeah. It's too short a time to really give it um, due justice, but just to say that we want to do a trainer training process working at the community level, but not on our own, working with partners to do this. So there's a lot of great tools, a lot of great resources out there. And so actually hearing from the colleague you just mentioned, Josh, is perfect and hearing ideas from this call is also um, really kind of incredibly useful. So um, thank you so much. I saw a colleague again from the Scouts, for example, we had a, a very good conversation with the um, Secretary General of the International Scouting Association uh, movement about how we can work with them on their environmental programs. So there's lots of different avenues and lots of different partners we can work with to make sure that adaptation is inserted into the into the schemes already there and uh, to kind of try and when needed kind of introduce new schemes. Great, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I'm looking at, um, um, I see a representative from WWF Netherlands. Uh, is there anything you would want to contribute to this? Uh, oh. I, sorry, I, my Great. camera was. Hi, thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, thank you all for your contribution. I think it, it again shows how important it is to look towards the future, not only looking about adaptation and impact for youth and indigenous peoples uh, local, uh, but also the environment uh, people depend on. I think it's, there is a lot going on and what we've seen, we're currently working on a program also that is focused on movements, on group of young, groups of young people finding each other, including in the Netherlands, where we also see it is going on. A lot of people have opinions and we were exploring, for example, collaboration with the young youth movement for um, bringing together all kinds of youth groups in the Netherlands, um, not just for education and, and capacity uh, strengthening, but also pulling those forces together for actual influencing of politicians uh, in the Netherlands of making a, a statement, engaging in SED discussions. So I think that's really important. Um, and that is not just happening in the Netherlands, it's happening worldwide. And I think just giving a push and a platform for these kind of movements uh, is important. And what we also want to try to support more and engage and see of more. So take, yeah, take more where you can. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you very, very much. Um, we have, I mean, we're over time, two minutes over time, but let's manage that. Um, quickly, I see in the chat that some Green from IIED and Anne Shooters have provided options to further the conversation. This is amazing. So please, if you have stories, projects that you're working on, 
on adaptation, please send them to, to Anne. Uh, she's posted her email address in the chat to make it possible for us to share the work you do. And to further the conversation, you can join the Hoover app. There's uh, details provided in the chat for us to take this conversation forward. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, Adriana, I'm just gonna come back to you to give me a feeling of your satisfaction to the answers you got to your questions. Thanks a lot, Joshua. Um, I think that every time that uh, I participate in any youth consultation, I always get inspired. And I think that is what is needed at this point of time, you know, working in the multilateral process and knowing how important have been to uh, achieve the Paris Agreement and the SDGs, now we have the challenge of implementation. And I think every one of you can play an important role. And uh, I will be very uh, happy to join GCA very soon uh, in October and to support all your initiative. I think that what we need to do is establish this partnership to build already on uh, what exists around the world. And the most important is it is the generation that can make a change. Many people say that youth are the leaders of the future, but I think that youth are the leader of the present. And we need to establish uh, this intergenerational partnership and to support different initiatives. And lo really looking forward to continue working with all of you uh, from the GCA uh, hat. Then congratulations for this wonderful uh, consultation. And I think it's just the beginning. It's a very exciting agenda and there will be many activities that will be organized. Then back to you, Joshua. Great, thank you very much, Adriana. And we look forward to welcoming you at the GC. I think you're already here um, with us. We look forward to welcoming you at the GC in October. I'm gonna pass it on to Anna who will wrap up the event by showing the work that we've been doing with young people briefly with one sort of a one a slide on how many people we've been talking to uh, and what partners we've been working on the youth program. And I'll also please uh, plead with um, colleagues, uh, um, Len, if you can do the poll again, if it's really that we get people to fill the poll again, you can do that. But quickly, Anna, please show uh, the work that we've been doing with youth partners who are here on the call and we'll wrap it up. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Lynn, if you can share the presentation, uh, please. So here's for all of you. I'm extremely, first I'd like to say that I'm extremely happy with this consultation and working with you. Uh, as Josh said, I'm really happy to see a lot of known faces here today. And this map shows exactly what we have been doing in just two weeks time. And I can say that uh, I'm super excited and super proud of the work we have been doing partners that are here today with us in this call we managed to have uh, now I just looked to the numbers again almost 700 people part of the YAN from more than 100 countries all over the world uh, I think this is a great achievement for us that are starting to work within the GCA and for you guys that were with us in our consultations we said that one of the most important aspects would to be to build up our programs in a non-tokenistic way and this consultation of today and the consultations we have been doing with you it's just to show that we really take it serious and this is just the beginning as adriana said for a lot of nice work that we will be doing together and we will do our best to facilitate and to put young people in the same table and to be considered as same stakeholders in the adaptation agenda as we always say in our talks in our consultations so i think this is a great uh, way to wrap up here to show that we are all in this together and we are going to move uh, it forward um, so thank you so much uh, and looking forward for the next steps thanks josh great thank you very much um I'm looking at uh, Lynn. Do we want to do the poll again? If not, we can take a group photo and end the session. <laughs> Great, so the poll will come up again. Um, I mean, we filled this in the beginning, but I guess some people joined later, so you can quickly fill this a um, few uh, seconds, and then we take a group photo and we end the call.
And uh, if you want to join the Youth Adaptation Network, I'm going to put a link in the chat, or Anna will do that. Uh, if you click on this link, you can sign up for the Youth Adaptation Network. And I think I can actually do the group photo while we fill the poll. It shouldn't interrupt it. So let's do that. Um, if you can put your cameras on, I'll really appreciate that. Um, and I'll make a group photo with everyone. Great. Okay. Now the difficulty is trying to get everyone on the screen, which is really difficult because we have <laughs> And more than more than uh, many people that are... uh, just take three I, i've got three screens of people so you need to kind of like take one person one screen yeah. and then together at the end okay first shot <laughs> great perfect now i'm going to take the second shot with different people great second oh. shot Please smile. I see uh, Juliet, you're putting your camera on now. I'm going to give you some seconds. Brilliant. Great. I have the second shot. And now the last shot. No one but Josh knows who's in what shot. So everyone has to smile the entire time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Kasim, great. I see Kasim. Uh, Kasim on, on. Okay. Brilliant. So now we are done. Thank you, everyone uh for coming really appreciate it and we will follow up with you uh on some of the activities that will come out of this consultation and this intergenerational dialogue we hope you enjoyed it and please uh, you have the emails of the speakers in the chat please get in touch with them if you have any inputs um, and we hope to work with you on the youth adaptation network thank you very much